Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen, amen. Thank you for that little special prayer as well, Brent. Uh, for those who are guests today, when you make your way out the back to the welcome table, um, I will not be there. I will allow one of our other staff members to greet you at the welcome table, just a little bit under the weather. But I am committed to be here this morning to preach the Word of God to you. We are in Jeremiah today in chapter 35. Jeremiah chapter 35. This is a very interesting story related to a group of individuals called the Rechabites. And I'll explain a lot more about what that means in just a few moments. But it's an intriguing story because of the faithfulness of this house and this clan who then became an illustration for the people of God. And remember that in all of these sermons, we are talking about parables or ways of illustrating God's message through the prophets by dramatic sign acts or other kinds of actions which demonstrate the word of the Lord. So today, as I read the first part of this, down through about verse uh, 11 or so, kind of keep in mind the way in which these sermons have been laid out related to illustrations, sign acts, parables, allegories, etc. Chapter 35, verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Go to the house of the Rechabites, speak to them, and bring them to one of the chambers of the temple of the Lord to offer them a drink of wine. So I took Jehazaniah, son of Jeremiah, son of Habazaniah, and his brothers and all the sons, the entire house of the Rechabites, and I brought them into the temple of the Lord, to a chamber occupied by the sons of Hanan, sons of Igdalia, a man of God who had a chamber near the official's chamber, which was above the chamber of Messiah, son of Shalom, the doorkeeper. I set jars filled with wine and some cups before the sons of the house of the Rechabites and said to them, drink wine. But they replied, we do not drink wine for Jonadab, son of our ancestor Rechab, commanded, here's what he commanded, you and your descendants must never drink wine. You must not build a house or sow seed or plant a vineyard. Those things are not for you. Rather, you must live in tents your whole life so that you may live a long time on the soil where you stay as a resident alien. We have obeyed Jonadab, son of our ancestor Rechab, in all he commanded us. So we haven't drunk wine our whole life. We, our wives, our sons, and our daughters, we also have not built houses to live in and do not have vineyard, field, or seed. But we have lived in tents and have obeyed and done everything our ancestor Jonadab commanded us. However, when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon marched into the land, we said, Come, let's go into Jerusalem to get away from the Chaldean and Aramean armies. So we have been living in Jerusalem. Let's pray one more time. Father, thank you for this word. What a great illustration of a people who have been committed to you, who have followed you with their whole hearts and with all of their lives. May that bring to us a great sense of how we too are to live. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So with this intriguing story, one of the first questions that we might have is who are the Rechabites? It's a little bit interesting to think about that name in particular, but let me give you just a, a basic amount of information talking about the Rechabites, the people. These are individuals who are of Kenite descent. And you may remember that Moses had a father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and it's understood uh, very likely, in fact, that that whole group of people could have been known as the Kenites. They were a semi-nomadic clan. This is a reading from one of my commentaries. A semi-nomadic clan that was associated with Israel's ancestors during the exodus from Egypt. So this current group of individuals are descended from those. But the Kenites, when they came with Israel into the land of Canaan, not all of them participated in this particular vow or lived in this particular manner, but only those who were of the clan of Rechab and Jonadab. And as a result, for generation upon generation, this group of people had lived a semi-nomadic life. They lived in tents. They did not farm in the normal way of farming. They did not live in cities as many of their other Kenite brethren had also done. 
And so you come to the time when Babylon is then beginning to assault Israel. And Jerusalem and the surrounding cities, so you know I've talked about this an awful lot in terms of the history. In this time, this group of individuals found themselves particularly vulnerable. And because of that, they determined that they would then go into the city of Jerusalem, which was a fortified city, which could withstand, at least for a period of time, as we know, eventually did fall, could withstand a siege of sorts. Interestingly, this group of individuals, the Rechabites, were apparently well known. They had, of course, over time, surfaced in the history of Israel a number of times, but their existence was well known, and it was known that now, at this point, they found themselves in Jerusalem, just as many others did, wondering what is the outcome of the circumstances with the Babylonians. And it is these people in particular, now in Jerusalem, that God spoke to Jeremiah through him to give a message to the king of Judah and to the people of Judah in their totality. And it did so in a very unusual way. You may have caught this as I was reading through the text, that what we see is that he brought the Rechabites in and put before them a test to see whether they would in fact break the vow that had been passed from generation to generation, the faithfulness that had been passed from generation to generation, the obedience that had been passed from generation to generation. And that's what we find, not only the Rechabites, the people, but the Rechabites, the test. The Lord initiated this test, brought them into a special chamber, and put before them wine and told them to drink. And they said, we must not drink do so. The test, in essence, was concerning their vow to the Lord and their commitment. And as we will see in just a moment, that ability to pass this test became a judgment upon the people of Israel, the king in particular, related to their lack of faithfulness. But in the sense of the Rechabites, they remained faithful. This test was concerning their vow to the Lord. In essence, their commitment to the Lord their God. The vow, in essence, consisted of no wine, no house, etc. They were to remain obedient to that initial command given through Jonadab that then generation to generation passed forward. Now, there's a number of things that I have thought as I've been working on this and preparing this, and I couldn't help but think about a couple of perspectives here that I think are important for us. First of all, notice that there's a generational passing of faithfulness. And secondly, there's a genera generational passing of obedience. So what we see, how important it is to pass on faith, to pass on the modeling of obedience to those in our own household, who then in turn will pass that on to generations further. There's a season of hundreds of years in which the Rechabites have lived in this manner. And somehow, faithfully, they have not only lived out their faith, their obedience, their faithfulness, but they have transferred that and communicated that in such a way that their sons and their daughters and all who came after them for hundreds of years lived this same life. And I think there's a great lesson for us here in terms of the passing on of our faith to our children and grandchildren, to those who are a part of our family, and ensuring that what we believe and what we hold finds fruition in their lives. Now, this, is ha this has to be a very deliberate action on our part. There has to be an intentional means in which we live out our faith, we practice our faith, we study our faith, and then as we model it to our children and those around us, they see it and they want it. You know, it's not too unusual for a son to follow the footsteps of the father in terms of vocation. But what is even more significant is not just the ability vocationally, but the ability to transfer faith generationally. I think that calls us to a, a strong evaluation of how well are we doing in the passing on of our faiths. How well are we doing in modeling our behavior? And I'm going to return to that in just a moment. 
So you have the Rechabites, the people, you have the Rechabites, the test, and then you have the Rechabites, what I call the example, and the parable. And this is found in verses 12 through 16. Because what you see here is that in the obedience and the faithfulness to God through all of that time, and in the immediate moment they passed the test, they passed the vow that was in front of them, they became a judgment to the people around them who did not pass the test. This is how the Lord spoke through Jeremiah, through the Rechabites, to say to the people around them, the Rechabites have been faithful, but you have not. There's a great sense in which when we live out our lives faithfully, just by virtue of living out our lives, that becomes a prophetic word to those around us who are not living in faith or who are not living up to the level of faith that they could. One of the interesting things, uh, I'll tell you a couple of things this past week. I had the chance to go to a theological education conference. It was in Guatemala. It was just a two-day thing, in and out really quick, really quick. And, uh, you know, I speak a little Spanish, but I can't follow all of it. And so I was sitting at one of the tables in a, one of the breakout sessions just listening to what was going on. And one of the other uh, faculty members from, I think he was from Panama, was actually there. And he was helping me making sure that I caught everything that was being said. And interestingly, around that table, one of the things they were talking about, and I'm going to use a technical term for it, and I'll explain this, was the syncretism of Christianity with other types of religion. Now, syncretism in the Old Testament was a dangerous thing. It meant that the people of Israel who had the model of their faith according to the Word of God would still take elements from pagan religions and bring it into their own practice of religion and mix those two together. Now, that's what syncretism is, the mixing together of different parts of religious experience. And around that table, as I was talking and listening, mostly listening, as I was being made aware, one of the things they said was there was still, even in their churches, syncretism in the form of superstition. And they began to explain to me more about what all that looked like, but it intrigued me because what it says is that there is, even in some church life, in this part of the country, that part of the country, in different places, an, an, an interesting mix of the things of the world with the things of the church. But let's put a little bit finer point on that. Sometimes there's a, a more dangerous mix, an interesting mix of the things of the world with our lives as we try to live it in faith. In other words, I believe that a part of what God wants us to see from this analogy of the Rechabites is that we are called to a high and holy standard of life. And that we must not allow the world to mix itself into who we are and what we do, but rather live above the world standards, adhering to God's standards alone. Now let me continue. There's so much in this chapter, and I don't want to belabor every particular point, but let me continue on because as you move through verses 12 through 16, you begin to see how important it is for the lives of faith to be examples to others. And then, in the latter part, to sum all this up, you have the Rechabites, the principles. And the number one principle that I think derives from this is an understanding that you are to keep a holy standard. I believe another principle is this, that though in the world, you are not of the world. And I think, lastly, you are to honor your commitments to the Lord, just as the Rechabites did. Among the many things that we learn from them, it is that when we make a commitment to the Lord, we need to honor that commitment, regardless of circumstances. Because you see, things were a little bit desperate. They'd already had to relocate out of the other environs of Canaan, Israel, into Jerusalem, which is where they weren't necessarily going to be and they were called into a special chamber and invited to drink wine how easy it would have been to have broken their vow but they were determined to live differently and to live faithfully 
I believe there is so much importance in this. And these are the applications that I take from this. Number one, when the Lord speaks the word into your life, act on it. Just as Rechab, Jonadab, spoke the word of the Lord that influenced the whole household and the clan of the Rechabites that became known throughout the country of Israel, the word of the Lord spoken into their lives, they acted on it. So we too, when the Lord speaks a word into our lives, we must act on it. When he gives a word about our direction, we must go in it. And when the Lord makes a claim upon your life, we must stay in it. Let me repeat those three. I think they're vitally important. When the Lord speaks a word into your life, act on it. When he gives a word about your direction, go in it. When the Lord makes a claim upon your life, stay there. Stay in it. See, the Rechabites had accepted a particular lifestyle because it was God's word to them. They seriously believed it and they obeyed it. And if we seriously believe what the Lord speaks to us in our lives, then we need to be obedient to it. When God speaks, we need to say, yes, I will obey. The second thing I think about this is concerning his word. Because the word of God is so vitally important to all that we do and all that we are. And here's what I think. The word of God, do not refuse it, do not restrain it, and do not release it. Did you hear that? When the Word of God comes and is presented to you, when the Word of God is spoken by the Spirit within you into your heart and to your mind, do not refuse it. Do not restrain it. Don't in any way say, well, I'm going to minimize that. And you may even do so innocuously. You may say, I'm going to do as much as I can. That's not enough. Do not refuse it. Do not restrain it. And do not release it. Do not ever let go of it. Third, as with the Rechabites, our lives are to be an example to illustrate God's purpose and plan. And here's what I believe about that, that our faithfulness to the Lord, our faithfulness living out our faith before others becomes a prophetic word to them about the reality that they live in compared to the reality that we hold and we believe and we trust. Our lives are always an example, and we must be prepared at every moment to ensure that the word that we have concerning the gospel of Jesus is made known to people around us so that they too will have the opportunity to hear and believe and walk in faith and have eternity with God. On the flight to Guatemala on Tuesday morning, it was early, left out of here early, early, and got down uh, to Atlanta and got on the plane and as, as, as is often the case, uh, I'm always just trying to be attuned to whether the Lord might present an opportunity for me just to share a simple word with someone. And I never know who I'm going to be sitting by. I mean, you've been on planes, you know how it is. It's just, it's, uh, it's just kind of a random thing, you think, but I think the Lord is usually at work in this. So I, I was in my seat, and sitting next to me was a young lady, and on the other side of, of her was an older gentleman, well, about my age. <laughs> Anyway, it wasn't that old. He was really young. So I, I'm thinking, Lord, you know, is there a possibility for me to share with one of the others? And obviously on a plane, it's kind of hard to share across someone. So I'm thinking maybe with this young lady, looked to be probably in her late 20s, early 30s, maybe somehow I can share a word about my faith or, or whatever it might be. Well, as typically the case, when you get seated in the, 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 the seats of the plane, you, you put your earbur uh, earbuds in. And that's the first thing that happened. I thought, okay, well, that's going to settle that. You know, they're going to watch a movie. I'm going to watch a movie. And therefore, you know, really won't have much chance to have conversation. But still, in the back of my mind, I was thinking maybe there's a chance somewhere along the way to share something. Even if it's just a real small thing. And so sure enough, at the very end of the flight, with just a few minutes to go, we'd had a little bit of chit-chat. But at that moment, she pulled her earbuds out and we engaged in just a little bit of conversation. And I told her what I did. I said, I'm a pastor. And she said to me, she's from the Netherlands. She said, I've never met a pastor. And I said, wow. I said, well, there's a good number of us around here, you know, back in the States. And I said, have you ever read the Bible? And she said, no, I've never read the Bible. I said, well, there's a very, very important verse that kind of sums it all up. 
It's John 3.16. Have you ever heard of that before? I asked her, had you heard of that? And she said, no. And then she turned and she looked right at me and she said, tell me. And I looked right at her. And I said, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. I said, only son, his unique son, that whosoever believes in him will not die, but will have eternal life. And she repeated the word, eternal life. And I said, that gives you a great summary of all that the Bible can kind of hold. And I said, John 3, 16, remember that. Repeat it. And she repeated it to me, John 3, 16. A few moments later, as we were getting very close to the gate, I turned to her and I looked at her and I said, now what was that verse I asked you to remember? And she said, oh, I can't remember. And I pulled out of my pocket. I'd written it on a scrap of paper and I handed it to her, John 3, 16. She said, you wrote it down for me. I said, yes. Never probably see that person again. One day, though, I hope in heaven. Our lives are constantly and consistently to be an example of faith in Jesus so that others will see and want what we have. You can do that too, by the way. How many of you know John 3.16? Yeah, I thought so. Let's pray. Father, help us in these moments of closing today to be so aware of the example of the Rechabites and how that became a source of judgment upon the people of Israel at that time and the king at that time and how that just confronted them so prophetically with the right and the wrong. And Father, help us to recognize that there's such an example here of how when we live our lives before you and we keep our vows before you and we are faithful and we seek to transfer that faith even generationally, Lord, that you use us in ways that we won't even begin to understand. And I pray very specifically for that young lady, Lord, we'll never see that person again, but I hope and pray that we will see her in heaven. And I also wonder, Lord, move in our hearts to be aware of the people around us who just need to see our example and who need to hear the words of the gospel, even if it's just a very, very, very short summary. So God, help us to recognize that the example of the Rechabites becomes in many ways an example like us to those around us. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.